Good evening, Hope family and friends. Welcome to Thursday Night Bible Study. I'm Reverend Jay. So happy to be here with you. Uh, grateful for the privilege and opportunity to uh, gather once again for virtual Bible study. So let's jump right in. And before we do that, let's uh, have a quick word of prayer. Gracious and heavenly God, our Father, we thank you. We praise you for this day, this time, this opportunity that you've given us to gather once again, God, to study your holy word. We pray, oh God, that you would be with us and speak to our hearts, our minds. Help us, oh God, to uh, again, discover, rediscover, and to uncover your truth so that we, Father, may live in a way that pleases you. We thank you, God, for all that will be said and all that will be shared. And we pray, Father, again, that you will get the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, I'm excited about tonight. We have a great uh, lesson uh, to get into, and I just want to jump uh, right in. So we're going to go to Matthew's Gospel, the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to look at the fifth chapter. Um, and uh, many of you uh, are aware and know of this uh, story, uh, if you will, this this teaching that happened uh, in Matthew's gospel and Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount. So it spans two chapters, but we're only going to be focusing on this, uh, this very short portion, what we know as the Beatitudes. Um, and so tonight we're going to attempt to get through uh, uh, verses one through seven. Um, I'm hoping that we do because I'm thinking this may be like a two-part lesson. So let's see how it goes. So Whatever access you have to the Bible, be it the hard copy, be it your tablet, your computer, your phone, whatever the case may be, join me in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 5, we're going to start at verse 1. It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain side and sat down. His disciples came to him. Verse 2 says, and he began to teach them. Now, something that I just noticed very quickly is that Jesus uh, when he was teaching, he wasn't standing up. He was sitting down. You know, so some people, you know, you may hear um, in churches that you have to stand to do everything. But that's not necessarily true, you know, especially if we're following Jesus's model. Jesus sat down when he taught. So there you go. Just a little something that you might be interested in. I, I was. <laughs> Verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Verse 5, blessed, or as some people say, blessed, are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I actually uh, included all of them. Uh, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of, because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, that's that's all of it. So that's verse 1 through 11. Tonight, we're going to focus in and attempt to get through verse one through seven. So let's just back up and get a little uh, context with regards to the text. So Matthew, right? Matthew, also known as Levi, wrote his gospel primarily for Jewish Christians who were living in Antioch, Syria. It was a Roman province who spoke Greek. However, there were Gentile Christians present as well. So this wasn't just strictly Jewish Christians, but they did have a, a mix. But for the most part, Matthew focuses specifically on those Jewish Christians who, again, are, are, are perhaps questioning, you know, wondering about Jesus, uh, the Messiah. So Matthew used this knowledge to help the believers fully understand and accept that the promised Jewish Messiah had come in the person of Jesus Christ and that in Christ was the fulfillment of the law. He recounted the genealogy of Jesus and continued by highlighting the birth, the baptism, and the wilderness experience of Christ. Matthew focused more on the life and ministry of Christ rather than the customs and rites of Judaism. Jews understood 
you know, the law. They understood, you know, the customs, the traditions. They understood what they needed to do. But how did this fit? How did this bode with uh, this Jewish carpenter from Masa uh, from Nazareth, right? Um, how, how did this make sense that, okay, now the law is not necessarily the focus, it's Christ. How does this make sense? How do we reconcile this understanding? And Matthew's trying to help them. Um, and so he presented a strong case in support of Jesus as Lord and Savior for all people, particularly the Jews. Now, our text tonight picks up on Jesus' seminal sermon that at its very core, when you look at this text, when you look at the Beatitudes, the core message found therein is love. Type in love. If you can, if you're with me right now, type in love. Love is the core message of the Beatitude. Now, yes, we get that uh, you're blessed or blessedness. Uh, that's how he starts off. That's what Beatitudeness beatitude means blessed. So we know that that's a part of it. And we'll get into, you know, what all that means. But again, I just kind of want to set the tone for tonight. Our focus is really going to be about love, love for God and love for each other. So I just want to set the stage there. So I love Matthew's gospel. And I love saying this every time I get a chance to teach it from this perspective. In my seminary, one of my favorite professors Dr. Virginia Wiles, she was my New, T New Testament professor. She, when we went through the Gospels, uh, kind of tagged each Gospel with a Jesus statement. And her Jesus statement, and I use it, I'm going to use it now, is Jesus, and the Gospel of Matthew, is the rabbi who teaches the hermeneutic of love. Jesus and the Gospel of Matthew is the rabbi who teaches, who, excuse me, who, yeah, who teaches the hermeneutic of love. Now, to put it differently, uh, and it, it, in, in my version, I would say Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is the teacher who explains the true interpretation of love. See, saints, love cannot be interpreted properly apart from God. You cannot understand love. You cannot uh, accept love. You cannot give love without God being at the core of it. So Jesus in this gospel helps people understand how to interpret love. What does it really look like? What does it really mean to be a community, be a believer, to be a follower, to be a lover of God and lover of Christ and a lover of each other? How do we do that? So family, if we want to experience the blessedness that Jesus taught about, preached about in this text, then we must understand love and its genuine nature. We have to understand love and its genuine nature. Now, Jesus was inviting the hearers of his message to reconsider their idea of blessedness. What was this idea or this notion of blessedness to a first century Jew? We can even ask ourselves now as 21st century Christians, what is or what would be, based on the world standards, what would be the idea of notion of blessedness? Well, I want to suggest for, for the text that blessedness was a consequence of faithfulness to the law. So the Jewish people understood that they were blessed if they were faithful to the law. And, and just as an example, if I did this, then I would receive that. So if I obeyed the law, then I would reap the benefits of the law, right? And many of us still believe that if we dot all our I's and cross all our T's, then 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 we will be blessed. And 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 you know there is an element of of there's there's that's factual, but it's not always truthful. Just because you do everything right, just because you have the right. Uh, degree or get the right job or live in the right neighborhood or whatever the case may be. It doesn't mean that you will experience the blessedness that Christ was talking about in the text. You will experience a form of blessedness, sure. But when if we really want the blessedness that Christ was talking about, it's way more than just dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. And, and, I, and quite frankly, it's, it's an impossibility when you think about it. Nobody living today or throughout eternity 
other than Christ has been perfect. Nobody. There's just no way for us to attain perfection in this life. And this walk will never do it. So we'll always come up short. We'll always be chasing after something in order to, you know, uh, uh, arrive at our destination, if you will. And so Jesus helps them to uh, perhaps reconsider um, this mentality, because when we operate under that mentality, it's actually a setup for disillusionment. Um, again, we have to expand our understanding of blessedness from from just sheer obedience to the law to obedience to the law giver. See, see the change there? It's it's subtle, but it's it's a it's a it's a change. When you focus or you shift your your focus from obedience to the law to obedience to the law giver, by default, if you are obeying the law giver, then you are obeying the law. Because the law was fulfilled by the law giver. Christ came to fulfill the law. He did not abolish the law. He fulfilled it so that through him, we might be reconciled to God. We might be brought to God as being justified, meaning uh, declared righteous, right? Because we couldn't do that. So Jesus in this, in this, in this, in this sermon, in this, this teaching, was trying to invite people, or not trying, but he was inviting people, the hearers, uh, at the at the at the, on the at that location, to consider changing their perspective, changing their understanding. The law was good. Don't get me wrong. The law was a guardian, but the law did nothing to convict the hearts and the minds of the people from the love of sin and and wickedness to the love of God and, and faithfulness. It just couldn't do it. it. It wasn't powerful enough, it wasn't strong enough. What it did though, again, is it pointed out our need for something greater, our need for something stronger. And so God in his infinite wisdom dispatched himself in the form of Christ to the earth so that we, his creation, would be able to be reconciled, to be restored back to him. Amen, amen. God saw the struggle. God saw that the law was good, but it could not transform the hearts and minds of the people. God sent his son, Jesus the Christ, to remove the burden of obedience to the law and replace it with the burden of obedience to the law giver. So now, saints, our burden is not to the law, but to the law giver. As followers and, and believers of Christ, as believers and followers of Christ, our burden is to obey him, to love him. And in so doing, we fulfill the requirement. We fulfill our obligation. And we then are able to, you know, produce the fruits of, of the, the works of that, uh, that faith and so on and so forth. And we really get into what Jesus was talking about in terms of blessedness. If you can't tell, I'm excited about this teaching. I'm excited about this word tonight. So, as I said before, Jesus fulfilled the law meaning he was perfect in obedience to the law because humanity could not. Jesus did not get rid of the law because Jesus encompassed the law. To put it another way, Jesus did the work of the law so that we might have faith in the law giver. By fulfilling the law, Jesus refined the idea or notion of what it meant to be blessed. So again, as I said earlier, it's not about crossing all the T's or dotting all the I's. That's that's just not the way we should understand blessedness. And Jesus came to help them that were there understand them that were there presently. And then those that would take that message and spread it around to help them understand that the way of blessedness was through love, was not through acquisition of material wealth and possessions and all these other things, not a bunch of do's and don'ts. But it is through faith, through the love we have for God that would bring us into the place, to the station of blessedness. Amen. Amen. So. Here's some things I want us to remember tonight. Loving Jesus fuels our obedience to him 
and it puts us in a position to be blessed. Loving Jesus fuels our obedience to him and puts us in a position to be blessed. Now, what does it mean to be blessed? What does that word blessed mean? Well, let's take a look. Blessed, or the Greek word makarios, means happy, fortunate, or well off. So every time Jesus was saying blessed, he was saying happy are, or fortunate are, or well off are. And that's that's what he was trying to help them understand. Okay. So the word blessed, makarios, means happy, fortunate, well off. And if you're taking notes, you know, it'll get a little technical tonight because I, I wanted us to really kind of understand um, because language is important and we need to understand the nuances of the text. Because, again, you're talking about a first century uh, uh, perspective versus 21st century. You're talking about language uh, from back then to, to now. And so there's some subtleties that we have to ensure we're, we're clearing up so that we can fully grasp what the meaning and the message of the text was. So, again. When we look at the word blessed, blessed in this text is used in a congratulatory manner. The pronouncement of blessed is based on the condition expressed by a noun or by a participle taking the place of the subject in the sentence. Now, I'm going to give you an example. So when it says blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit, being poor in spirit, is the reason why one should be pronounced blessed. So there's an attachment, right? The blessedness, the pronouncement of the blessedness is a congratulations, right? It's a celebration saying, look, you are in a state of blessedness or you are blessed because you occupy this space. And so Jesus said, blessed or blessed are the poor in spirit. And we'll continue on and go for, further down the line. But that's the first one. He said, blessed or blessed are the poor in spirit. So happy, fortunate, well off are the poor in spirit. Now, Jesus, he revised the definition and interpretation of love by shifting the focus from self to others, right? Jesus came and, and shifted the worldview that you had to just take care of yourself. That was all about you. And remember, the Jewish community was was the, 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 the house of Israel. Right. They were the chosen people of God. And so they would have thought that, you know, it's us and not them. But we know that when Christ came, he came to open that doorway to everybody. So this this gospel, this new way of life wasn't just about who I who I grew up with or who looked like me or who thought like me. No, this was this was breaking all of the rules. This was changing things up. This was radical at the time. And even today, it continues to be radical because people still don't understand fully what it means to love, what it means to truly love the way that God loved, the way that God calls us to love. So Jesus, again, he shifts the focus from self to others, being happy, being fortunate or, or well off was not based on the acquisition of material things. Rather, it was the change in disposition from self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. Hear me well. It wasn't about how much you have. It wasn't about who your mama, who your daddy was. It wasn't about where you came from. Jesus changed the focus from self to others, the change in disposition from self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. Christ now became the center of the universe, the center of the solar system, that which everything revolved around. So it was no longer about me. It was about us and we, right? It was about Christ. And so when you consider uh, the love of Christ, the love of Christ is sacrificial and conditional. The love of Christ is patient, pure, and protective. The love of Christ is kind and compassionate. It is not envious. It is not boastful or proud, and it is not easily angered. The love of Christ is eternal and therefore will not and cannot fail. 
too often, saints, we chase after the things of Christ rather than just simply Christ himself. We missed being blessed because we focus on the blessing rather than the one blessing us, right? We, we want the benefits of the relationship, but we don't want the relationship. Um, I know somebody can testify to that in a natural sense. We've dated and experienced relationships where we may have been with somebody who just wanted us for the things that we could give them rather than uh, us ourselves. And, 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 and that's not right. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not a genuine love. That's, that's, a, that's a, a, a dysfunctional love. That's a perverse love. And so Christ straightened that out. He came to show and embody what real love looked like. And so God would have us to rightly understand the meaning of blessedness through this lesson and through his teaching. So let's again, let's look. Sorry, Saints, I'm not sure what happened. The technology, the computer signal maybe dropped out. I'm not sure. But anyway, let's get right back into it. So I was saying um, we're at blessed are the poor uh, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, uh, the word poor is, uh, 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 it, it's, Tohas. Uh, poor in the Greek is tohas, and it means one who crouches and cowers like a beggar, deeply destitute and helpless. So poor in this text is used as an adjective. It is modifying or describing the noun spirit. Uh, now the word spirit uh, in the Greek is pneuma. Um, and, and that, that references, um, the, the spirit, uh, in, in terms of our soul. Uh, and, and so that's what poor in spirit. So the one who crouches, the one who is low, the one who is, 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 is cowers like a beggar, deeply destitute and helpless. Uh, the type of poverty Jesus ascribed to the blessed or the blessedness was at a level deeper than societal standards. When we think of poor or being poor, we think of not having material wealth or lacking physical possession. So I, I don't have enough food. I don't have clothing. I don't have shelter. I don't have a place to live. But see, Jesus pushed the matter beyond the surface level in order to reach the root. He wanted the hearers to strip themselves of their preconceived notions and baggage. The kingdom of heaven, saints, cannot be earned and it cannot be purchased. Jesus wanted people to understand that they had to rid themselves of everything that they ascribed value to so that they could receive what was truly valuable, the salvation that came from Christ. That's really where the value lies. It's not in what we have. It's not in our status. I mean, even when Jesus talked to uh, the rich young ruler, remember uh, the rich young ruler said, I've, I've done all of these things and I've kept the law and I was faithful and kind and everything like that. And Jesus says, it says, listen, sell all your things, give all those things up. And the, and the rich young ruler said, listen, I can't do that. And he walked away missing his blessing, missing the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God represented in the form of Christ was right before him, offering him invitation into this new way of life. And yet he misplaced his value or misplaced the value on the things rather than what Christ was offering him, which was the salvation that could only come from him. But tonight I wanna to use a different example 
If you have your Bibles, and again, I hope you still have them open, uh, look at Luke 18, uh, verses 9 through 14. I'm going to highlight it, um, but you can read as we go along. So it says, uh, you know, this is the story where you have the, uh, the two men who went to the temple to pray. Uh, and, and one was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. Now, the Pharisee believed that he was a, a pious person. He was faithful to God and better than others. He even bragged about how he fasted and, and, and his tithing practices. He was like, listen, I give 10 percent. Every time I come, I'm doing this. I'm I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm I'm just so, you know, I'm a super duper uh, believer. And, and look at me and I'm great. And he's a Pharisee. Now, the tax collector, on the other hand, believed himself to be sinful, lowly, powerless and lacking in everything. He was so down. He was so low that he wouldn't even look up towards heaven. His face was to the ground. Um, he simply beat on his chest like this and begged God for mercy. See, the Pharisee was like most in that he thought his works made him bigger and better than others. He had confidence in himself and his belongings rather than faith in God. He wasn't trusting God. He was trusting in his, his own strength and his own uh, knowledge and his own wisdom saying, listen, you know, I'm great because I have these things. Meanwhile, the tax collector who, by the way, um, worked for the Roman government, uh, got rich off of his own people. You know, he had things, but he understood that that was of no consequence. That was of no value. His life, in a sense, was worthless. And he knew that he needed something more. He knew that he didn't deserve it, but he knew that he should cry out uh, to, to get something more. And that's the poverty. That's the poorness in spirit that Jesus was referring to. See, the tax collector recognized that despite his material wealth, he lacked anything of genuine value. Out of contrition and humility, the tax collector pleaded for God to withhold the justified wrath he had earned. Saints of God, we as human beings deserve the wrath of God because we are sinful by nature, but God in his gracious graciousness and his mercy has the ability to withhold the justice that we deserve and afford us another opportunity. And so he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, this, this type of poverty, this is the type of poverty in spirit uh, uh, that Jesus meant and, and declared in his sermon. And so what I want us to really uh, again, I know I've said it before, but I want us to understand this this love thing. Uh, and, and, and this is going to be repeated throughout uh, the remainder of our time tonight. Tonight. Love for God is the origin of blessedness. Love for God is the origin of blessedness. Love for God is the genesis of obedience. Love for God is the genesis of obedience. And love for God is what leads to the kingdom. It's what leads to the kingdom because it says, blessed or blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. So if we are poor in spirit, the, 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 the congratulations comes because we've, we've, in, we've, we've inherited the kingdom. We've, we've been received, we have uh, accepted Christ's invitation and now are being received into the kingdom. Now that doesn't mean, right, that we walk around beating ourselves up or that we, you know, woe is me. That's not what Jesus was saying. It's a perpetual, continual thing. It keeps us in a position where we recognize and acknowledge that we are inferior in and of ourselves, juxtaposed to God's superiority. Our inferiority shines bright and is, is illuminated in the superiority of a supreme God. So it's, 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 it's making sure that we keep ourselves in a position where we, we uh, continue to, to lower ourselves to the point where we acknowledge our need for God. 
our need for his love and his, his salvation, because there's nothing that we can do. There's nothing we can say that will earn it, that will merit it. There's nothing, saints. But the great thing is God is so gracious, so loving um, that he gives it to us in spite of it. Amen. So here, I just wanted to put that up for you if you were taking notes. So again, spirit, pneuma means the rational spirit, the power by which a human being feels, thinks, wills, decides, the soul. So again, blessed are those that are poor to their core, that are that are just destitute to their soul, that they rely fully and completely on God, that they inherit the kingdom or the kingdom is theirs. Uh, the next one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, the war, word mourn is pentheo. Pentheo. That's how I had to hear it. Pentheo, uh, which means to grieve. Pentheo means to grieve. Now, the mourning Jesus talked about was not simple sadness, sorrow, or feeling down. Jesus was emphasizing the need for humanity to literally grieve its proclivity to sin, to weep over their sinful hearts and minds. See how Jesus is building on what he just uh, what he previously said. So poor in spirit now mourning. Mourning, weeping over our sinful hearts and minds. And as previously mentioned, the law was a guardian that pointed to humanity's inability to change its propensity to sin. So you should be, Christ was saying, listen, it, it's okay to weep over the inability to overcome the power of sin because guess what? There's comfort. There's comfort available now to those who believe. See, sin's powerful grip remained in place and Jesus announced that mourning would lead to comfort. In him, humanity would find Comfort. Now let's look at that word comfort. Comfort or parakaleo, parakaleo means to refresh or to cheer. So grieving over the sinfulness, the sinful state, uh, and allowing Christ to, to take over and accepting his gift of salvation leads to our comfort, our refreshing, our cheering, if you will. It's it's how we get over um, where where, you know, being um, it's how we get over the feeling of, of, of separateness or feeling of inadequacy or feeling of, of being less than when we when we acknowledge and, and recognize that, again, we in and ourselves can't do it. But we know that in Christ or through Christ, we can. That's when we recognize and that's when we receive the refreshing and, and, and the cheer and and the story that I want to highlight or the text that I want to highlight to help um with this with this uh you know blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted is Psalm 51 1 through 5. So again if we're taking notes mark that down Psalm 51 1 through 5 it's a very familiar psalm it's actually David um acknowledging after he's done all, you know, he's, he's done his dirt. He's, he's, he's accepted the consequences or, or been handed the consequences. And now we see David pour out his heart. He's mourning. He's grieving over not necessarily the loss of the child, not necessarily, um, you know, what he, he did per se, but he is grieving over his offense against God. He's grieving because he did evil in the eyes of God. So David, we know um, he engaged in adultery with Bathsheba. He got her pregnant, tried to hide it. He sent Uriah with his death certificate to the front line. And then he, you know, tried to, you know, he, he tried to, you know, cover that up. And so God was displeased and did not allow the child that was conceived to live. And so David deeply and sincerely wailed over his sin and in contrition and humility 
ask God for forgiveness. And so we know because because even in, in uh, further down in the text, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew me a right spirit. David was asking for God to bring him back, for God to comfort him, for God to refresh and cheer him. And so that's what it means there. When we are mourning or, or if we get to the place where we mourn over that, that sin, not that we're sorry, you know, we're mourning over, um, you know, trivial things. Um, like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in mourning because, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, didn't have the, the, you know, couple bucks that I thought I should have, you know, God can take care of those things and I'm not making light of it. But what I'm saying is, is that when we mourn over offending the heart of God, that's really what I wanted to say. When we get to the place where we mourn over our offense or offenses against God, God will bring us to the place where we will receive refreshing and we will be uh, brought back to the place where we should be in God. That's really what I'm what I'm trying to get at here when it's and, and, I, and I believe that's what Jesus meant when he was teaching uh, the people blessed are blessed are blessed are they uh, that mourn. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Um, you know, it, it again in in that time in that era, you know, mourning over your wickedness wasn't seen as helpful or as useful. It was kind of like get over it and keep moving forward, you know. And that's just not what 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 we should be doing. It's not, hey, get over it and keep moving. No, take a moment to really consider. What 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 happened and 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 reflect and introspect. You know, why did I do that? Why do I continue to do that? Why is that still a stronghold? Why am I still struggling here? Um, and allow the Lord to to move, allow His Spirit to move upon your heart, so that you um, you move to the place of mourning, and God, in response, brings refreshing and cheer. Because remember, it was. Blessed, happy, well off, um, in a congratulatory manner, right? C congratulating you for being in this position. So we're poor in spirit. Now we're mourning, and and we continue uh, to move because this is the type of mourning that Jesus said would be comforting. We must remember that despite the removal of the power of sin, the presence of sin, sin still remains. When we fail and falter, we should not make excuses for it or attempt to justify it. We should, in fact, mourn over it. In our mourning over it, we will receive comfort. In our grieving, we will be refreshed and cheered. The love Christ has for us covers a multitude of sin. He came so that we could obtain something that we ourselves could not merit freedom from the power of sin and redemption from the punishment or penalty of sin. So love for God is the origin of blessedness and love for God is the genesis of obedience. Love for God is what leads to comfort. And so the text continues, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they uh, will be comforted. Now, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, the word meek, meek means uh, prous. And that means mildness in disposition. Now, meekness is, is interesting because uh, when you think about meekness, it it it, it tend you we honestly when we think about meekness we think about you know oh, weak and and frail and timid, but saints of God, biblical meekness is actually controlled strength. It's acknowledging that strength is a tool used for building and not necessarily breaking. So. 
back in biblical times when they wanted to uh, um, break a horse or a stallion, they would uh, use a, a, a bridle or a bit. And, and so the image is the, the, the stallion is powerful. It's, it's, it's massive. It's, it's majestic. But the stallion submitting to the, to the bit or the, or the, the brittle um, is an example of meekness, strength under control or controlled strength. Submission to the 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 bit uh, without uh, overcoming the bit, without wrestling against the bit, and so that is the idea that Jesus was trying to um, was that Jesus was teaching or promoting or, or promulgating in in this sermon is is that meekness. Uh, is is not about being weak. It's not about being timid. It's not about being, you know, run over. It is about strength under control. And so when we think about the, the context of the text under Roman rule, it was hard to imagine success coming by way of meekness. Meekness was viewed as weakness and timidity. How could meek, meekness be a weapon in the fight against imperialism? Now, I want to put a pause real quick and say that Jesus's mission, we all know, was not to come to the earth to overthrow the Roman government and set up the Jewish kingdom or the Jews as the the rulers of 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 the world. That's that's not what his mission was about. That's not why he would come. Jesus focused on the reconciliation of humanity back to God. Rome and its army were not the enemy saints. We get it messed up sometimes. We focus on the wrong enemy. Our, you know, the the politicians, the you know, the, the law enforcement. You know, they're not the real enemy. The real enemy is Satan. And God could have easily disempowered Rome, just like God could if, could easily disempower those who have power. God can do that. But the enemy Christ that came, and the enemy Christ, the enemy Christ had come to conquer was sin and death. That's who Christ came. That's who Christ came to attack and defeat. And he was successful in that effort. He was successful in that endeavor. That's why we have uh, salvation now. That's why we're free in Christ because of his work on the cross. So saints, our disposition to God and to each other characterizes the condition of our hearts, how I treat you, how I treat others, how I treat God will, will, will demonstrate, will reflect the condition of my heart. If I neglect time with God, if I'm disrespectful to my brother or my sister, that is a indication of my heart. And, and, and sometimes we got to work on that. We have to, you know, it'll it'll get exposed. The, the 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 you know the fruit we bear will demonstrate what type of tree we are. You know, if we are a, a tree of life, we will produce fruit. But if we're not, we'll produce things that are not healthy, that are not helpful. We just won't. And so we got to make sure that we're in the right. We have the right connection. That we're planted in the right place. That we our disposition has changed because life is often filled with challenging circumstances. Some are expected while others are not. Saints, it's all a part of this journey. Sometimes we know that the challenge is coming and other times it comes out of nowhere and we're just totally off guard. Just what, are you kidding me? You know, and it could be one thing after the other, like, like just piling on top. And sometimes it happens that way. Nonetheless, our response to both, whether expected or unexpected, should be the same. Meekness, saints, is forgiving the person who disrespected you. Meekness is honoring the leader in spite of their failings. Meekness is staying faithful to God in the midst of chaos and, and disaster. Meekness is allowing God's love to flow th to you and through you for his glory. And so if we simply examine the life and ministry of Jesus, 
we will find several examples of him displaying meekness. Think about it, his conversation with Mary and Joseph at the temple uh, when he was a young boy. Jesus was the Christ then, and not like he was never the Christ, you know, or the Messiah, but he controlled himself in a way that he honored his mother and earthly father, if you will. He didn't disrespect them. He still told them, listen, I'm about my father's business. And I submit to your authority in that I'm going to go back with you. And he did. And then the, and the word of the Lord, that text says Jesus grew uh, in, in stature and in knowledge and in wisdom, which is kind of interesting because the all knowing one. But it's more for us to, to understand as human beings. So, yes, it wasn't it was, it's not it's not uh, contradictory or anything like that. It is simply trying to help a human mind understand a God concept. Amen. Uh, his entry into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a don donkey, meek, humble, lowly. Uh, his trial before Pilate, they were hurling insults at him. They were making accusations. And Pilate was like, don't you want to respond? And Jesus was like, if you only, this is Jay, this is Reverend Jay, this is, this is really just Jay. If you only knew what I could do, but I'm going to just hang back, sit tight, and let this all play out because what y'all don't understand is I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this because if I don't do it, then you will still be bound in the cycle of sin and the power of sin and the bondage of sin. So hurl all the insults you want at me. Say whatever you want. Make this false accusations. I'm still going to honor my father and do what he sent me here to do. And saying sometimes we got to look at situations in the face even in the midst of those tough circumstances, even when people are straight up lying on you, straight up talking badly about you, using you, abusing you, you focus on Christ, you focus on God and you complete the mission for which he sent you and you allow him to receive glory and honor and let God deal with them other folk. Let God be the one to take care of those people. We don't have to worry about it. I know sometimes it's tough and sometimes we want to do things, but listen, can't nobody handle it better than the Lord. So uh, his trial before Pilate, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, talk about strength under control. Jesus was praying and they said it was like drops of blood coming from his, his head. And he said, Father, uh, if it be your will, may this pass from me. And then in the same breath, he said, yet not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus, strength under control, controlled strength. And 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 finally, his conduct on the cross. I, I mean, it, it, it speaks for itself. I don't have to go into detail. It, it speaks for itself. And so this is the type of meekness that Jesus said would partake in the eternal salvation of God's kingdom, right? Bless are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And the earth means to inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus was preaching a worldview that was counter to the current culture. That message is still counter to our current culture. Military might, brute force, and sheer strength was not the way in which salvation would be achieved, right? Repaying evil for evil was no longer the standard for justice. Christ shifted the gaze of humanity from selfishness to selflessness. Love for God is the origin of blessedness. Love for God is the genesis of obedience. Love for God is what leads to inheritance of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Next verse. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, hunger is paneo, paneo, which means to crave ardently, to seek with eager desire. And thirst is dipseo, dipseo which means an eager longing for those things by which the soul is refreshed, 
the soul is supported and the soul is strengthened. So see, it's not, it's not about a physical, right? Both of these, hunger and thirst, have nothing to do with the physical body, yet it has to do all with the spiritual body. And so um, humanity had then and still has today a natural inclination to depend on, upon its talents and abilities to satisfy its cravings and its desires, right? We see God as more of an option rather than uh, the only plan, right? We see him as an alternative. So if this doesn't work out, then I'll try God. Or if that doesn't work out, then I'll try God. Or we'll just lump God in with whatever we're doing. And so God is just an option on the shelf, right? Rather than just being the only thing on the shelf. That's what God is. And that's who God should be to us. But we, you know, we still try to do that. Humanity had and still does have an addiction to self-satisfaction and self-gratification. I, me, take care of mine, take care of me. Let me make sure that it feels good, that it tastes good, smells good, sounds good. All those things. It's about satisfying the self and gratifying the self. And Christ is saying that's not the way. See, humanity chases after things that leave it temporarily satisfied. And as a result, it develops a dependency. Think about it. When we drink or, you know, uh, try a narcotic, there's this this uh, euphoria that we experience, and then it sort of it, it, it awakens um, something we didn't even know that we had this desire for it. So then we start to crave it. And we start to want it more and more. And we start to do it more and more. And, and then we are, we are at the place where now we are dependent upon it. We can't even get through the day without it. We can't, you know, that's all that's on our mind. Our, our focus has changed because we are so consumed. It's changed our physical chemistry, our brain chemistry. And so now we're in a place where I have to have this thing. And Jesus is saying, that's not what we should be hungering and thirsting after. These temporal things that really, at the end of the day, leave us empty once the euphoria goes. But see, relationship with God is, is always euphoric. It's always good. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a temporary sensation. It's, it's eternal. It's continuous. It's perpetual. It, 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 it's, it's stable, right? It keeps you not like these other things that we chase after. And so Jesus announced that it was righteousness, which is right standing with God that would address the hunger and thirst issue of humanity. And so the perfect example that I could think of or that was you know, brought to me in this time of study was uh, the example in John 4, 1 through 14. And we know it. It is Jesus and the Samaritan woman, Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. And so. The Pharisees in the beginning of the text, they were they were keeping score of the baptisms that were taking place uh, with John and Jesus. They were baptizing people in the name of the Lord. Um, and then Jesus and his disciples were going to head back to Galilee. They were on their way back to Galilee, but they had to go through Samaria first. And so Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, he asks her for a drink. She was shocked because she's like, look, why are you, why are you a, G a Jew asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink? You know, we don't have dealings. We're not you know, we're not kosher. We're not cool with each other. So this is confusing to me. Um, we're not social. We're not cordial. But Jesus told her that if she really understood and knew who he is or was, I mean, I'm using past tense because of the text, but, you know, Jesus is. But if she really understood who she was talking to, she would have given him a drink um, based on his identity. Um, and then she sarcastically said, well, who are you? You know, are you greater than than the one who, 
you know, gave us this well? You know, are you greater than Jacob? You know, the one that, you know, established this well. And, and Jesus said, folks who drank from the well would continue to be thirsty, right? Because there was a temporal satisfaction that came from drawing from that well. But Jesus also, and Jesus uh, changed the game by saying, if you drank from me, if you get the water from me, I'll have it springing up in your spirit so that it will never run out, that you will never be thirsty. You won't be hungry again. You'll have everything that you need. And so this is the type of hunger and thirst that Jesus said would be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, not those that hunger and thirst after more money, after more status, after more women, after more men, after more children, after more education, whatever the case may be. Jesus said, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled, meaning will be satisfied. So let's go back to it. Those that crave ardently and seek eagerly righteousness, those that are eager and longing for the things by which their souls are refreshed, supported, and strengthened, aka righteousness, will be filled, will be satisfied. And so Jesus pointed out that he was the one, Jesus was the one who could provide the thing that would refresh, that would support and strengthen the soul. Jesus personified righteousness. Jesus. Righteousness in flesh shifted, again, shifted the gaze of humanity from the love of self to the love of God. Now, again, just want to put a pause here. There is nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with wanting and going after material possession. It's nothing wrong with wanting nice clothes, nice shoes, a car house, any of those things. Right. There's nothing wrong. However, when the material possessions become the source of your satisfaction or the driving force behind your living, then you and I, we enter in a, into a state of apostasy. In other words, we make our decisions and to a larger extent ourselves, an, excuse me, an idol. Our, I think I said decisions. I meant to say desires. We make our desi desires and to a larger extent ourselves idols. Because when we start craving uh, the desires uh, that have nothing to do with God, that are strictly temporal and, and, and temp you know, and, and, and of, of, of really no value, when we start chasing after those things and see them as giving us worth or even looking at ourselves and saying, hey, look at me, look at my degree, look at this, look at that. Then we create the, des the desire and even ourselves become an idol. And we all know that idolatry is, a, is, an, is an affront to God. It's a sin against God. You know, that's, that's something that we don't want to do. So Jesus enters into this, this scene in in, uh, under Roman occupation saying, listen, I know you're in this city where it's, you know, there's, there's strength, there's might, uh, there's money, there's all these things that you could try and, 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 and attain or uh, acquire. But the ones that change their worldview and their perspective to hungering and thirsting, to craving ardently, to yearning for righteousness, those are the ones that are going to have true satisfaction. Those are the ones that are going to be satisfied and, 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 and be okay, be content in their living. See, it's important to crave ardently and seek with eager desire the righteousness of God. For in so doing, our desires will be fulfilled. Saints, love for God is the origin of blessedness. Love for God is the genesis of obedience. Love for God is what leads to being fulfilled. Now, it's it's just about eight o'clock, uh, and so I, I 
I, I had one more, but I want to, I want to stop here because again, um, I want, you know, this is going to be a two part lesson. And so we'll pick up, uh, God willing, the next time that we, we come together, we'll pick up, uh, in this text and continue forward with, uh, the Beatitudes, uh, in our discussion and our dialogue about love, about God's love, about understanding that love for God is the, is the beginning, it's the start, it's the foundation of blessedness. And love for God is the, is the start, it's the beginning of obedience, which if we love God, we'll obey God. And, and, and in our obedience, we remain faithful to God. So saints, it's, it's critical for us to understand that blessedness, right? Happiness or uh, being well off or, you know, being, being satisfied, being, being blessed. It's not based on you know what what we what we have as a matter of fact you know it, it's it's based on who we have if if that's a better way to say it when we have god when we have a relationship with god when we when we are rooted in christ then we are truly blessed if all we had was a relationship with god and 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 our, our rootedness in christ then we are blessed we wouldn't need any we wouldn't need any other thing we wouldn't need you know clothes and shoes and all those other things now yes we got to have those things you know to exist in this world but that's not where our blessedness comes from and that's not where we should invest our love we really shouldn't because those things will let us down those things will leave us feeling feel, feeling feeling unfulfilled. They really will. And so I'm hopeful and prayerful that we would, again, examine ourselves and look at our lives and see where we fall short or see where we're, see where we're doing well. See, see where we're actually, you know, yeah, God, I'm, 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 I'm doing those things. And then, you know, evaluate, well, here's where I could do better. Or here's where I could change things up a bit and, and really try and, 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 and refine my understanding and refine my perspective and focus, because that's essentially what Jesus did. You see, Judaism, Jesus was a Jew. He didn't stop being a Jew. He followed the law, but he refined what it meant, what, what Judaism was. He, he expanded it, right? He, 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 he opened the door to this thing called uh, salvation, to faith alone and Christ alone. Like I said, he, he, he fulfilled the law, yet didn't abolish it and said, through me, is the way to eternal life. So Saint, thank you. Thank you for, for being here tonight. Thank you for joining. Thank you for participating. I am so happy and pleased at what God is doing uh, in the life of Hope Church, in this ministry, how he is um, bringing us further and deeper and higher and wider in our understanding of him and in our relationship with him. And so again, my prayer is that we would continue on this path, that we would move forward and, and just celebrate our God, give God glory and honor in our living. Be holy, stay holy. Don't allow anything to change that. So let's end uh, in a word of prayer. Gracious and heavenly God, our Father, thank you Praise you, glorify you, honor you for this daytime and opportunity you've given us once again to gather virtually to study your word. God, thank you for our leader, pastor, and first lady. Thank you, God, that you have continued to keep them and bless them. We thank you that you have established a firm foundation through them in this house of prayer and evangelism. We pray, God, that we would continue to study your word, that we would allow it to go deep into our hearts, take root and grow so that we might live for you. Father, pray for those that might be sick and infirmed. I pray for those, God, that are struggling um, in their hearts and minds. Father, you speak to them right now because, God, you are able to do all things. You are an incredible and an amazing God. Life is in you, Father. And so I pray that as we continue to study your word, 
that we would draw ourselves even closer to you. And that when frustration, fear, doubt, or any of those things seem to set in, that you, Father, your spirit would speak to us and we would follow your voice, that you would lead us to a place of safety and refuge. Now, God, we again ask that you would allow us, if it's based on your will, God, to come back again next week so we can gather and study again. We pray this in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, family. Thank you so much again. Love y'all. Uh, see you on Sunday. We will be here, 845 and 1115. God bless you. God keep you.